Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. I am super excited about today's conversation because it's all about keto, one of my favorite things to talk about. And with me is the man, the low carb leader actually. And this guy's got over 50,000 followers on his Facebook. And he, and his whole purpose is to bring the information to the public. And that is my friend, Daniel Perryman, who is a martial artist, a physique competitor, fitness and nutrition enthusiast, host of the Low Carb Leader podcast, with over 20 years of hospital executive leadership experience, Dan brings a unique perspective to the health and fitness world. He is a hospital CEO who believes that a low-carb nutritional approach can transform the healthcare system. Spending the last 20 years in hospitals, he has seen the devastating effects of chronic health conditions on society, and his goal is to keep people out of these very the very hospital he leaves. So thanks for being here, Dan. Hey, thank you for having me, Karen. I'm excited about this. I was recently on Dan's podcast. Yeah. So I wanted him to have on, come on my podcast because he's been in this industry now for how long? Uh, in the, the health world for like 20, 20. The health world, but how about the keto world? Yeah, probably, probably 10 years with uh, personally doing low carb and keto 10 years for sure. Wow. And so you came from a very standard American diet, but you were never like overweight or on how like you were always pretty sporty, weren't you? Right, right. I was never like like you said, I I was a martial artist. We owned a yeah. school when I was growing up and uh always lifting weights, always so really never, never overweight. So weight loss was was never an issue with me with keto. It was actually I was and, and I say low carb because I, I started low carb and then transitioned to keto. But I, you know, the first probably 20 years of my adult life, my diet, my nutrition was horrible, horrible. Fast food. At one point, I thought to myself, I'm eating fast food like three times a day. Oh, like, my gosh. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I was thinking one time, I, I probably have not had a vegetable in like a year. Honestly, like it was <sighs> that bad. And so my, I was running hospitals and it, you know, it takes a lot of mental energy to run yeah, hospitals. I bet. And I was just dying. Like after lunch, I would eat lunch. And then an hour later, I'd be just mentally crashing, barely keep my eyes open. And that's actually what led me to uh, trying something different. And my son, who's 25 now, he he was, he was always into powerlifting and all that. And he actually said, have you thought about low carb? And oh, interesting. Yeah. So my low carb journey started with a salad after lunch, actually, <laughs> to try to stay so, away. That was your low carb? <laughs> that was it. That was it. And, yeah. And I would just mention too, you were the youngest black belt <laughs> in your, in your state, was it? Yeah. Yeah. So I At started. 11? Yeah. I started Taekwondo when when I was uh, seven and th I became a black belt at 11. And, I, wow. and at that time in Taekwondo, like as opposed to today, like there's a lot of young little black belts now who are like, you know, seven years old or something. But uh, back then they actually didn't want to give it to me because I was only 11. And I was already in, in Taekwondo for four years. So they finally gave it to me after like six months. But yeah, I was the youngest black belt in Iowa. That's uh, my, my claim to fame, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I just, I love that you were, like you switched to low carb, because we don't hear this story often. Usually when I talk with people and I interview people in here, it's always, well, you know, I gained weight and I started having all these health problems. So I I went, I went keto or paleo, but here you were, you were actually in incredible shape. You were very physically active. You just we're not eating very well. Right. And of all things, your son tells you, Hey, why don't you try low carb? So take us on that journey of, you know, what kind of happened to you then physically that changed? When yeah. You so that? started with a salad and then I thought, wow, like this is, I feel a little bit better. I'm, I'm not so tired. Right. So I started putting it all together and then both me and my son together actually just started like investigating low carb. And this was probably 10 years ago when 
you know, paleo was, I think paleo was out because Mark Sisson was probably around at that time. Yeah. But there wasn't a lot. So no. uh, we went to paleo, FX, uh, paleo FX, right? And started going to these conferences and learning more and more. And the more I learned, the, the more I wanted to learn, right? So I kind of started paleo and then low carb. And then I started questioning my berries and, and then, you know, and then I'm like, can I eat dark chocolate? So, and then, you know, year after year and then turning, I just turned 51. Uh, so, and, and my mom has dementia on her side. And so actually I knew about keto. I've, I researched it, but I really started looking at keto for, for health reasons, right? Cause I had, I had done a couple of physique shows. So like weight was never an issue. And that's most people, like you said, Karen, go into mm -hmm. keto because of the weight. Right. But I, I really focused on what are the health benefits and, you know, uh, cognitive abilities and, you know, now they're calling dementia glucose, you know, type three yeah, diabetes. Type three. And, and so I just want every, every possible chance of, that I can to not get dementia, right? That was my entire goal of really going keto. And uh, unfortunately, I had this nutrition coach who I was paying a lot of money to, and he helped me prep for these physique shows. And the more I learned about keto, I'm like, okay. And, and we actually kind of had an, <laughs> we, we parted our ways because he didn't oh, like, like that. I was like, I'm like, I can't be carving up now. And, you know, it's, it's not good for me having these huge carb days. And so that, we kind of went different directions at that point. So did you do your physique show on keto? No, no. Oh, okay. I, I was like, holy. Yeah, I was very low carb. And then I did these wow. physique shows. Okay. And most of the nutrition is low carb. But you have these major, major Carb days of yeah. just, you know, dirty, dirty cheat meals, right? And so, and I started really getting concerned about those because, I mean, they work for the phys physical, right? But. I was like, what is this doing to me uh, from a metabolic standpoint, from a mental standpoint? And I came to a point where I'm like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, because for, the, for those who don't know, like when you do a physique show, you stay very low carb like all week. And then you will, you will literally. And low fat, right? And, and low fat. Like it's, and you're just depleted. It's and, just broccoli and chicken breast. Oh, oh it's, horrible. it's horrible. Don't do it. Don't do it. And. And then on Saturdays, I would have cheat days or cheat periods, like four hours long. And, and I, would, I would eat like 800 grams of carbs in like four hours, oh. right? And the only way you can do that is by eating like large Dairy Queen chocolate shakes and Rice Krispie treats. And that, that's how I would carve up because there's no way you can eat sweet potatoes and get to that level. You just have to like eat a bunch of junk food. Okay. And uh, so, but then I started getting concerned, like I said about, what is, I don't know if eating, you know, two or three large Dairy Queen chocolate shakes is good for me, you know, and Krispy Kreme donuts like by, by the dozen. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because that's it, because you wanted all sugar with no fat, right? That's right. kind of, that was the goal. So uh, that was it. So, oh. so I've been through a lot of iterations, yeah. Yeah, and when you look back on that, because I've worked with some women in doing, that have done fitness competitions that have serious metabolic issues post um, competition where they, they start to rapidly gain weight, they get right. very hormonal. Did any of those things happen to you and you afterwards? Yeah, well, the worst part was, and, and luckily I had a coach who, he did physique shows, so he, he had prepped me for this, but like the worst part is, well, the, it's very difficult mentally because you're, keep in mind, I was running hospital, hospitals at this point, right? So I'm, I'm in my office, I can't think about anything. I can't even focus at, on anything because I was at 1200 calories a day for like, you know, eight weeks. I was, I was just drained. And metabolically, like my hands were always cold because my metabolism was crashing so quickly. And that's why you did these cheat meals on the weekends to get your metabolism back to like at least semi-normal, right? Wow. So anyway, so you go through all this and then, and my coach had, he, he warned me about all this. So we knew what we were doing, but afterwards, um, I, and I tell this story that I went to, I, I went to Vegas for the week after and I actually planned it this way. I'm like, I'm going to look the best I've ever looked. 
right? And I'm going to be shredded. So I'm going to go to Vegas and hang out like at the pool, right? That was like, oh, yeah, how ridiculous is that, right? So it's I, human, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, I went to Vegas and then I was like, wow, like I'm, I look great, right? And but then within one week, because keep in mind that my body was in starvation mode all the way, right? And the minute I started eating food, because once you get done with a physique show, you just, you need to ramp up your calories to get your metabolism back up. And within a week, it all goes to fat. So I probably went from 7% body fat to, you know, 10 or 11, which is still really low. But after like, you know, a year worth of work to get to a really lean, uh, you know, body fat percent. So you could look good in Vegas. Yeah, exactly. How ridiculous. I, I <laughs> no, so, it's not. It's I get it. Yeah. It, it, I know. Yeah. Uh, but then you're like, then you're like, oh my, you start mentally like this is horrible. And, and my coach had actually warned me about this saying that it's going to be very difficult when you go from show condition to a week later. So that was mentally, it was very hard. So I would say if there's anybody doing physique shows or thinking about it, unless there's a real good reason, I wouldn't even do it. Like it is, it's very damaging to your body. Extremely. Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. It's horrible. And for women. Oh yeah. I mean, they're, your menstrual cycle is going to be messed up by uh, your hormones, everything. I think, I think women actually, it affects them far more. Yeah. Yeah. Far more. And unfortunately, a lot of them will, will start doing steroids or whatever because um, you're around a lot of people. I was natural, right? And, and I went to a non-tested show and, and I looked pretty good, but I was almost embarrassed. Like the people were so big. And so I could see how somebody would say, hey, if I'm going to compete, I'm going to have to do what they're doing, right? To yeah. even compete. But then I went to my second show was a natural show and we were – we actually had to take a, a lie detector test and urinalysis. And, oh, wow. But everybody was more normal size there, right? But I would say, yeah, like, it's the same with, like, running a marathon. If people say, oh, I want to run a half marathon or a marathon, it's very damaging to your body, um, yeah. these type of extreme sports. So yeah. unless you have a really good reason why you want to do it, I'd probably say don't do it. Don't do it. And I think what drives it, of course, is ego, right? We want to we want to look good. We want to push our bodies to look good. We're not doing it to be healthy. We don't choose right. to go into a physique show because we think that that's the ultimate health to look that way. That's never the reason, right? If you're telling yourself that, you're full of you know what. So <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all ego. It's so you can go to Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you can go to Vegas on the pool side, man. But, you know, Dan, let's just think about that from a broader perspective of what's going on right now in our world in North America, which is women are starving themselves. They are calorie reducing in order to lose weight. And that includes doing the ketogenic diet. Like I, I see it all the time where women come in and they're telling me they fast for days on end and they're eating eight, 900 calories a day and they're, they're, they're going carnivore because they want to lose right. more weight. And let's just think about what you just said, which is you had to eat extreme amounts of sugar to rev back up your metabolism. Like, right. what does that do to our bodies when we're putting ourselves in a starved state? Right, right. And if, because, you know, what people don't realize, and, and, and I tell a lot of my friends this, I'll, I'll say, you're doing this yo-yo diet, you know, you're going to reduce your calories. And, you know, the yo-yo diet's like, that's a whole nother subject. But people will, so you're, say you're burning, I'm just making these numbers up, but say you're burning 1,500 calories a day with your resting, you know, metabolic rate. Then people will cut, say, okay, well, that makes sense. I'll cut down to a thousand, right? But what they don't realize is that your body, your metabolism is going to slow down and you're going you're gonna to burn far less calories per day. So it can actually, you can cut down 500 calories a day and start gaining weight, right? Because your metabolism is going to go underneath. So, so then you're eating a couple hundred calories in excess. And people don't realize that. And they're like, I, I know several women who 
never eat. And, and they don't eat on purpose. They just, you know, that type, type of person that just like is never hungry. Yeah. And they're skinny, but they're kind of fat. They're that skinny fat, right? And they're always like, I can't get rid of this fat. And my response is always, eat some food. You got to eat, right? You're not eating. When you're eating 800 calories a day, you will not lose your fat. You will not lose your fat, no matter what you do. Go to the gym all you want. You're not going to lose your fat. Because your body thinks you're starving. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting that how to fix that is to metabolically shock the system with high calories. Do you, have you ever followed Matt Stone? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, you should check him out. He's a kind of a radical, I would want to call him, I guess. I got to get him on the show just because it's another perspective. But his big thing is, follow, he's, you know, he was paleo for a long time. I'm not sure if he ever went keto, but went paleo for a long time, found that it worked really well for him, and then ended up starting to gain weight and basically started to dig into all this research. And his big thing is you're slowing down your metabolism too much when you follow some of these diets, right? Whether it's primal or whatever it is, but if you're slowing down your metabolism, you got to rev it back up with high caloric food. So he gets people to eat super high fat, high sugar foods to fix their broken metabolism. And so people gain weight from it, but it, they get warmer. Their metabolism goes up right. and their body temperature goes up when they start eating more calories. And I'm like, yeah. God, where is there like this? How can we find a happy balance between the two? So have you found that? Like you've done these competitions, you've come out on the other side, you're now this, you know, low carb leader. And do you, do you feel that you kind of know where that sweet spot is now? Yeah. And luckily I, I found it when uh, we were doing the competition. So uh, when when we first started, I was eating about eighteen hundred calories a day, just because I, I've never ate a lot, right? It's just I just kind of I'm I'm not that hungry. Like I'll eat a couple meals a day or whatever. But I started eighteen hundred, and over several months, we were ramping up my calories like slowly though. Like so, we would figure out this upper threshold, and so every maybe every week we'd go up a hundred calories. So we got up to twenty seven hundred. So I ate at I ate eighteen hundred a day. And we went up to 2,700, keeping in mind I was working out a lot. And um, I actually w was losing body fat and gaining muscle and pretty much staying the same weight. And I had added 1,000 calories a day. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. Right. Because uh, my metabolism was shot when we started. Right. Just because of the, the way I ate. And so people can't fear those calories. It, it's actually you can't lose weight. Most people are not losing weight because they're not eating enough. And that sounds so counterintuitive, but it's true. Your, your body is not going to let you starve to death. Right. I mean, and, and especially in the keto world, it, it, somebody will say I lost seven pounds the first week. Well, we all know that's water and all that, but, and then they're like, well, I want to continue that. I'm like, your body is not going to just go to zero. It's going to survive and it's going to, you know, our bodies are smart. They're going to survive at any cost, at any cost, which means um, it, your body will sacrifice your health to survive, right? I mean, always, yeah. It's when, like, example, when you get cold, your, your warmth and your blood goes to your internal organs to save them, despite that you're going to be frostbite and lose your fingers, right? Your body is going to keep you, try to get you to survive. So, um, you don't want to, you don't really want to challenge your body in this way. You have to come up with something that's well balanced and that your body's going to, you know, uh, optimize your health. Otherwise, um, you can lose weight. But the reason you try, you want to lose weight is because you want to be healthy. Right. right. If you're losing weight to be healthy, but you're doing it in an unhealthy way, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Which we see so much of that right now when you like, go on Instagram and, you know, or Facebook and you see people putting on keto recipes and it's like, here's your burger with five pounds of bacon yeah. and cheese and onions and butter. And it's like, mm, no, yeah. I, don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. I don't think that that's a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. So what are some of the most like, what are the most or some of the non-obvious reasons why we want to be following a keto diet and be healthy that's not weight loss? I mean, 
you're somebody that did it for no, for not for weight loss and you were in great shape. So what are the benefits that maybe some people aren't thinking of? Right. So, uh, mental focus, right? So, um, and, and this kind of goes in line with intermittent fasting too. I'm, I'm a proponent of that, but I'm a proponent if, if you know what you're doing and just if you're starting out with keto, uh, I, you call it this comparitis, right? Everybody's like, oh, I'm going to start keto. And they look online and they're like, they're going to see somebody like me or you that have been doing this for a while and say, well, we intermittent fast. We don't eat till two o'clock. We, we tried one meal. That's don't do it all at once. Right. You just, you start with, with one thing, but cognitive performance. I, I am definitely clearer when I'm eating keto. I, for me personally, the, the big issues I have is with sleep. I, when I was low carb, I would without fail wake up at two 30 in the morning. And, and I'm, I know it's my blood sugar going wacko. Right. But every day, like years, I didn't sleep. Wow. And, and uh, so sleep and then energy uh, was the issue too. And, and now I'm using some exogenous ketones. And so I'm 51, right? I, it's like <laughs> I'm 51 life, guys. Yeah. Life is hard. Don't worry. Hard. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, yeah. I need every advantage I can once you hit, seems like once you hit 40. 40. 40. I was going to say, um, it happens. Like I literally, it was like my 40th birthday and everything started to go downhill for a moment. I'm like, what is happening? Even my doctor was like, yeah, I'm telling you, you hit 40, everything goes down. I'm like, oh. I, I, I swear, yeah, 40 is rough. Uh, and then you hit 50. Yeah. But, you know, so like I said, uh, so not eating sugar is, you know, very beneficial to your body. Ketones are your perfu- a preferred fuel source, right, for your brain. Uh, so for me, inflammation reduction and, uh, you know, there's no medical claims. There's just a lot of research around keto and MCT oils and stuff for uh, better brain function. And, but with me personally, like I would, uh, I'm weirdly sensitive to stuff. So mm-hmm. like my allergies are always kind of whacked out and like I take allergy medicine for a couple of days and my joints are aching. So I'm like very sensitive, but when I eat high sugar, my joints ache. So like my hips will actually like hurt. It's almost, it's almost like they grind together in a, a weird way. But when I go keto, it's gone, right? It's gone. So, and I'm sure that's inflammation is gone. And uh, so just healthier, right? Yeah. It's just, it's like, do you sleep better now then? I do. I do. Um, actually sleep has been fixed with, since I've been drinking ketones too. That has oh, really fixed interesting. Me. Yeah. So and, and I think that's a good point. We were talking about comparing ourselves to other, yeah. others. You know, somebody might be looking at like what I'm talking about and saying, oh, you, you must feel great all the time and you're eating. Because I, I eat pretty well and I work out and I do all that. But as you, as you get older, you, you have to like do a lot more things to try to recover better. And even though I eat well and you know, recovering the gym now is much harder. I have to take an extra day off and it's just part of aging. And so, but just, you're going to be different than everybody else. So if you, if you weigh 200 pounds and you're comparing yourself to somebody who weighs 150 pounds and they're saying how they're doing great. And it's, it's all about how long have you kind of damaged your metabolism and, and, uh, I had a doctor say one time that for every year you've just dis- you, like destroyed your body, it takes like a month to recover. So his point was 10 years, right? So if you've, if you've eaten really poorly for 10 years, which a lot of us have done longer than that, 20 oh, yeah. Yeah. years, it's going to take you a couple years to get back, right? Yeah. It's just not going to, you're not going to go keto and a week later, you're going to be like, oh, I feel great. You're... Yeah. You're, we're undoing a lot of damage, but uh, I think there's just so many benefits to it. As long as it's kind of a well-balanced keto, right? Yeah. I don't, I, I try to avoid like, I avoid processed foods. I don't, I don't eat a lot of the uh, sugar alcohols and stuff. Occasionally I'll eat a little bit, but I, I think one of the mistakes is people go keto and they don't want to give up stuff that, you know, so they, 
they used to eat a lot of cake and now they're going to start eating keto cake. ice cream, keto cake, fat bombs, yeah. you know, bacon and all that. That's, I don't think that's really good for you in the long run. Right. So when I do have bacon, it might be, it's going to definitely be like uncured, uh, you know, I'll occasionally eat hot dogs, but and somebody actually said like, oh, you're eating hot dogs. And I'm like, they're 100% grass fed. They're, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I am paying like a dollar per hot dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, we are, this is not the no name brand hot dogs <laughs> yeah, for a dollar yeah. 25. For a These are not uh, like ballpark frags. They're not, no. you know, but so I, I do think that like a well-balanced because I'm doing it for overall health as opposed to weight yeah. loss. And yeah. I think I, you know, I've, I, I do see some people that actually promote what, what they call the dirty keto, right? Or lazy man's keto. And they're kind of promoting that, you know, eat bacon, eat cheese, eat tons of cream. And it's really dairy heavy and lots of, and they're not talking about grass fed meats and right. it is just the hot dogs with the new hot dogs. And it's interesting because for someone that say is used to a standard American diet is 200 plus pounds, that might be the gateway, like the gateway drug, right? It right. might be the, the gateway to get them to lower their sugar consumption because those foods are still low carb, right? right. And they're, they're, they're not good for you. They may be causing some inflammation for a lot of people and clogging up your heart and doing a bunch of other nasty things. But just the lowering of carbs and the amount of sugar that's coming right. into their bodies just to break the, the addiction to it. I, I've seen that work. And it's just, I think if, if that's you and you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, but that's, you know, I need to have my keto cake and I need to have this. I need it. To, that's okay for a while to get started, but don't right. think that it's healthy in the long run is I think the key, right. like, doing one thing at a time. I think we were talking about this earlier about like some people just think if they, we were talking about alcohol earlier, Dan and I, before we started and how some people think like, Hey, if I, as long as I'm drinking these nude drinks or whatever they're called, the no carb drinks, I'm okay. That's still keto. And it's like, no, or you can't just take, <laughs> he was telling me a story. His friend takes apple cider vinegar, although he smokes and drinks every day. And it's like, well, that's not going to cure you of everything, right? And it's just yeah. best not to put the blinders on and fool yourself and know that eventually that's where you're going to have to go is on a healthier keto journey, I think. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I'm a believer in, you know, just do one thing, right? If, mm. if, if you're thinking about starting the keto journey, uh, you know, I, I would say take one thing at a time. Cut out sugar for a week, right? Mm -hmm. Cut out sugar for 21 days. They, they say it, it takes 21 days to start a habit. And, and I, was, I was doing the math and like, if you, did, if you did one little thing every 21 days and then in, in another 21 days, do something else that's small, like cut out sugar, cut out sodas for 21 days, then mm -hmm. cut out sugar. And by the end of the year, you, could, you would have like 17 nice things done and you would be a lot more healthier, right? But yeah. don't... Don't do not. Here's my one warning. Do not go into keto and say, I'm going to go to strict keto. I'm going to do intermittent fasting. I'm going to uh, start going to the gym. I'm going to do this because you're not. You will do it for, you'll think about it for a day and maybe do it for a day. And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, uh, you're going to be sore and hungry and, and everything's going to stop. But putting, going from five sodas to one soda a day is very doable. So just do one thing. Yeah, I, I completely agree, especially come January, right? Because oh. January, <laughs> everybody, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this, which is great. It's a great time of year for my business because everybody wants to yeah. join my group. Everybody's into it. But it's like, how do we keep this going, right? And you, you have something to say about that, about not joining a gym on January 1st. Yeah, yeah. Do not, <laughs> do not join a gym. I have, I have some uh, good friends who... They all bought Apple watches. And oh, so okay, right. at, and at the first of January, so they can all track each other's yeah. stuff, right? And oh now we're in, we're in the middle of January and like, I haven't heard anything. They're Nobody's all, wearing the watch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all, they all, you know, sharing about how many steps they're doing. And, uh, you know, January 1st, it's just, it was, it's just a date, right? It's just, a, it's, there's no difference. We just, 
somehow came up with this New Year's resolution thing, which is ridiculous to begin with. If because there's people that will fail at joining the gym. First of all, you're going to join the gym. You're going to pay a year's worth and sign into a contract and you're going to not want to go January 20th. And then you're going to be stuck with another 11 payments. That's, that's one thing, right? Yeah. Just the um, financial cost. Everything. Yeah. The financial cost, but start, you, this goes to mindset, right? If, yeah. if, and, and I always like to bring this back to smoking because like for those who have smoked, you cannot quit smoking unless you want to quit smoking, right? You can, your wife, your husband, whoever, your spouse, whoever can want you to quit smoking, but until you decide you're going to really, you really want to quit smoking, you won't. And that's the same way with keto, right? Or working out until your mindset, until you're really focused on, say, I'm going to go work out twice a week. You won't because it's fun for a week. And then, I mean, I, I've worked out for a long time and, you know, there's a lot of relapse in people who work out. Like sometimes I'm like, I don't want to go to the gym. Right. And, but when you're starting, you don't even have that habit formed yet. And so you're going to be sore and you're, you're going to be hungry and you're going to be, and unless you have a why, and this is, I, I always tell people you got to have a why. So my why is I want to be healthy uh, I want I want good brain function. I have I have kids. I want to be healthy for them, uh, and so it's easier when you think back and you're like, okay, what's my why, as opposed to something vain like I want to look good, right? Looking good or getting in shape or some obscure goal is not going to get you there. You have to like it's got to go. Want to be there for your grandkids to grow up, yeah. or you want to see your kids graduate college, or that's meaningful and that will get you there, right? As opposed to, it's January 1st, I think I should do something. Yeah, I just actually recorded a podcast yesterday about that actually, about like finding your why here in January, oh. about goal setting and I made this big thing like, you have to you have to get good reasoning behind it. Most people, unfortunately, they wait till they get like the diagnosis, right? Like, right. okay, you're type two diabetic, your cholesterol's too high, you're gonna have you have heart disease, and then they're like, oh crap, I better do something about this. And that's enough leverage to make them do it, like that scare. But if you don't have that, you do. You have to like dig deep, and you have to scare yourself too. It's like, okay, if I don't do this what's going to happen? Like, what's the worst case scenario? Yeah. Type two diabetes. You could get a limb cut off. Right. I mean, you right. worked in the hospital, Dan, like you yeah. saw firsthand what happens to people. When yeah. They don't do yeah. One of, one of the first hospitals I worked in my office uh, window overlooked the smoking area. That's I was in <laughs> Kentucky and that's when you could, you could smoke. Right. And out, outside on campus, it's kind of all smoke free at this point, but uh, next to us was this health clinic for pregnant women. And this was rural Kentucky, right? And daily I would sit, I would sit and watch pregnant women with IV smoking. Right? That's and, so bad. Yeah. And and you know, even you fast forward now where where we're we're we try to focus more on health, but you know, that's we were buying wheelchairs that accommodated 500 pound patients and some thousand pound patients, oh right? God. Wheelchairs. So that's why, you know, I think around 70% are now uh, overweight or obese. It's in the hospital setting. It's, it's incredible. And that is why I started focusing on myself, first of all, with prevention. And because if you think grass fed beef is expensive, uh, <laughs> Yeah, try try a ICU stay or chemotherapy or something, right? And I'm not saying that keto or a nutrition plan or exercise or anything else will. I may get sick. We all may get sick, but I, I'm going to try to at least stack the odds in a positive favor, right? Because I know if I smoke, if I drink a lot, if I eat bad food, if I don't exercise my chances of getting sick or a serious disease are going to be a lot higher than what I'm doing now. Right. And, and just all you got to do is be around sick people a lot. I mean, I spent 20 years around them and 
we made our money on them, right? And so as a hospital CEO, I was, I was doing this podcast uh, at the same time I was a CEO. And, and I, don't think, I don't think like some of the people in the corporate like that because I was, I was kind of saying like MDs don't really, they don't focus on prevention because they don't. They don't know anything about nutrition. And, and they're, they'll say that. I mean, they'll have, they're, you know, they're very well trained in what they do. But MDs treat sickness. That's what they're there for. They don't really focus on prevention. And they, I think they get about four hours worth of nutrition in, in their 11 years of school. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Which, and so, and they'll be the first ones to say it. I, I used to, I used to uh, share with my doctor, like benefits of coffee and benefits of this. He'd be like, oh, really? You know, but when I get sick, I tell you what, though, when I do get sick or when I have a, a accident, I am very happy the hospitals are there. A hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. But uh, best thing you can do is stay out of the hospital. What were some of like, just scare us a little bit, Dan. Like what were some of the, you know, nutrition driven or the lack of nutrition driven diseases that you would see a lot in there with your obese patients? Oh yeah. And you know, I think the worst part is children. I mean, obese children. I mean, children who are four years old that weigh, you know, 120, 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately you see, I can tell you what a child looks like by seeing their parents. And so you would see these families and, you know, the bad part is like, 30 year old people would be riding in on scooters and they would weigh 500 pounds and where 30 years old is supposed to be like the prime of your life. And they're on oxygen and, you know, they can't breathe at night and they they're in there. And so we would have a lot of young patients and a lot of it is obesity driven where, you know, extra weight is just, you are going to have major, major problems. And, and it's getting younger and younger, right? And so bariatric surgery was is huge, right? Where, and, and unfortunately, I I know I know a lot of people personally who have had weight loss surgery, and it's interesting because we talked about mindset. And if if they don't get their mind where uh, they need to be, they will find ways. Like I mean, there's stories of somebody having a weight loss surgery. And these are like. Ex- you know, if you don't know about surgeries, they're extensive. These are serious surgeries. And where they would be, you know, blending up their meals and drinking it through a straw and finding ways to expand their stomach. This is right after surgery. And so wow. it's, it's just this major, major problem. But I interviewed Dr. Fung, who's uh, Jason Fung, who's this yeah, uh, intermittent fasting expert. And I just and- had Megan on mine. Oh yeah, Megan. Yeah, yeah, Megan awesome. yeah. yeah, and he said he got tired of cutting off limbs. Oh my gosh, tired of cutting off limbs. And that's why he's like, I got to fit. I, I am just, I am just treating the symptoms and the disease. Oh wow. And that's uh, yeah, because I don't think people realize. Like, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna lose your limbs. You, you know, with diabetes, is it's a serious, serious thing. It's and very I, serious. Yeah, and I think. You'd be surprised though at how many people um, don't take care of themselves even yeah. after they're diagnosed. And, uh, yeah. But interesting though, we would be serving high sugar, really bad food. Of course. To you know, cancer patients, and so yeah, it, yeah. It, it's it's, uh, it, it's a very broken system for sure. Yeah. So. Let's go, you know, let's talk about then what else then besides just the eating part. Like we, we know that, you know, low carb works so well for so many people. You've been in this industry a long time. You've got a lot of people following you. You've been, and in your own journey as well, what else have you found that needs to be part of it? Like the mindset, spirituality, things like that. Like where, you know, where have you come to with all of it? Yeah. So I think, I think number one, at least with me, is, is sleep. And it's so overlooked now. There's, there's a couple of studies. So it's saying that like 60, 70% of all people have social jet lag, which means basically they're sleep deprived and they go around kind of in this zombie-like state and they don't really know they're sleep deprived. 
they, uh, I find this really interesting. They did this study with pilots and they sleep deprived. I think they were getting about four hours of sleep per night. And then they would, they would measure their functionality, you know, uh, prior to sleep deprivation. And then they would do it after. And obviously their, their performance like was terrible after. Right. But when they, when they asked these pilots about their performance, they would say, Oh, it was great. And so our body, I read this paper that says our body will mask sleep deprivation and you'll think that you're okay, but you're operating at the substandard level, but you think you're operating at a better level. Right, which is yeah. I just find that really interesting. I do too, and then you see that with my clients, with my the women that come in, and and I ask them if they ever slow down or take time for themselves or sleep well or whatever it is, and they're like, "Oh, I'm fine. I can. I'm good on five hours, six hours of sleep." And and I don't really like to slow down. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I I feel it. If I sleep six hours, I'm kind of tired throughout the day. Same. But if I sleep seven or eight hours, I I'm like a different person. So, Same. and so like a couple tips are how you should really wake up thinking about sleep and that's, you know, nobody thinks about sleep, but your, your sleep pattern is basically when you get up. So they say even like a four, like four minutes worth of exercise, like a, a Tabata uh, program, right when you wake up or some jumping jacks or something will help you sleep better. It sets your hormones up better. Um, I use these, I use these every night. Oh, sweet. Yes. Blue blockers, right? Yeah. yeah. I always tell people if you, if you got yourself a partner or you're not in the dating scene, you may want to invest in these nice shades. Yeah, <laughs> you can yeah. wear around at nighttime. Yeah. Well, I, I went to, I went to cool ones. Like my, my, I have these really uh, industrial, like cheap ones and my kids would always make fun of me, but um, this allows you to, so like when it gets dark, you want to get into this circadian rhythm, right? When it gets dark, you put these on. Uh, because we weren't designed for blue light. If you think about it, like in, in ancient times or whatever, we had we had campfire, right? And that was a red glow, and that was that didn't affect our melatonin production. And you know, you look at an iPhone or an Android, whatever you're looking at, a flip phone, for like 15 minutes at night, it can suppress your melatonin for four hours. So four hours. So that's your iPhone, your computer, your TV, your lights. So what this does is it blocks all the blue light out and then your melatonin doesn't get. So that, that, that tip, this tip, I would say, number one, let your kids make fun of you and they'll get bored. Yeah. <laughs> and my daughter always says, I don't like to put these on because they make me sleepy, which is interesting. Interesting. Yes, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I, I haven't. I haven't bought them yet. I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you've convinced me. I got it. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I I, I know I, I sleep better, and knowing that uh, quality and quantity of sleep is different, right? You can. Here, here's a great example. Go drink a fifth of whiskey, and you will sleep for eight hours. Yeah. Right. You're going to wake up feeling horrible, or, you know, as opposed to. You know, so here's kind of my routine. So I put these on close to bed, maybe an hour before. What's what's really good is if you can take like a, you know, they say bath is really good to kind of calm you. For for the mothers out there, this is a great chance to maybe get away from the kids for a little bit. But then they say too, then after your hot bath, take a cold shower because you sleep, you want to lower your temperature because you sleep well. And then the same time you go to bed, the same time you wake up, seven days a week. That's key. And then blackout curtains, right? So this is a, I, I don't know, Karen, if you heard of this study. This is, this is crazy. Oh, so the, the they, clock light? No, the, oh. it will kind of, yeah. But they, they did this study and they had this person in a completely blackout uh, room, blacked out room, not any light at all, and took a quarter size uh, patch that had light on it. And they put it behind the person's knee under the covers and it affected his sleep patterns. So your skin, you, you think like I'll wear some, this is what you do in hotels, right? You're gonna put a uh, blindfold over you and so keep the light out. Your skin knows, your body knows when it's light out and 
we're, we're, we evolved to wake up when it's light. And so all this stuff, and if you say I'm sleeping well, um, quantity and quality is different, right? So, uh, so those are just little things. So I try to focus a lot on sleep just because I feel so much better when I, I sleep. Much better. Everything, like people that have food cravings, sleep right. better. If you sleep right. better, you're not going to eat so much. It's just right. Energy, yeah. Right. Like if, if you don't care about sleep, good luck losing weight if you're not sleeping. Absolutely. I, I concur. hundred percent. hundred percent. And people hate hearing that. Like just sleep. And it's like, you want your magic pill? There it is. Right. Get a good night's sleep because of what it does to the entire hormonal system, your hunger hormones, everything, the cortisol, which is our number one cause of weight loss resistance in women right now. It can be monitored, like brought down with sleep. So, right. And, and you 100%. can, you cannot out willpower your hormones. No, no, it, not at all. And no. so sleep. And then just this whole mindset. The last thing is like, mm-hmm. and this, this is something I've always been like, I always thought was kooky, right. With this, this whole positive affirmations <laughs> and like, you know, uh, Stuart Smalley from Saturday night live, you know, when he looked in the mirror and he's like, I, you're good enough. And I like you. And, and I always thought that was so kooky, but so I read this book, Psycho, Psycho Cybernetics. I don't, I don't know if you read it or not, but, mm-hmm. uh, and basically they're saying like, what, whether you set a goal or not, your subconscious is driving you to a goal, yeah. right? Yeah. Whether you meant consciously know it or not. Yeah. And at that, like I read that and that was, that almost shocked me because I'm thinking like, all right, where, where is my subconscious taking me? And if you don't think subconscious rules your world, it does. Right. It's like 95% of your thoughts and actions are driven by your subconscious, which is mostly developed, I do believe, when we are quite young. So in the sense of, right. when I say developed, like limiting beliefs and what you're, what you're, exactly. what, what you're thinking is, is driven by stuff that you've learned at a very young age. Right, right, exactly. And so if you're not writing down a goal and knowing where you're going – you're going somewhere. Um, and that's actually, that was the most, that actually kind of uh, shocked me a little bit to my core. I'm like, oh my, I, I never write down goals. And you would think, you would think a hospital CEO who like would know this stuff, right? We had goals for the hospital. I didn't think about my own personal goals. Right. right yeah. So writing them down, but back to this positive affirmation of, you know, saying it out loud, like, um, have I'm I'm a champion. I'm I'm successful and doing it in the present term. Not saying in ten years I'm going to be this. You're like right now. I am successful. I am I am confident. I am you know whatever. And just taking a couple minutes a day, and you actually be surprised saying that out loud. After a couple minutes, you're like, wow, I feel better. I feel more positive. My mood's better, right? Yeah. And so I started doing that. That's started doing that recently, and that's very helpful, right? And mm-hmm. and doing and I learned this stop technique. So I tried tapping. Have you heard? Yep, yeah, yeah. Like, I know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if tapping worked for me or not. I just I, I don't know if it worked for me either, but I don't think I gave enough of a try. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there, there's a stop technique where, you know, for those who have these negative thoughts, especially in the entrepreneurial world, right? When I was a CEO. Uh, it was, it was easier because I had structure and I had, I had all this stuff and I was, I was successful in my, in, in the field. And now I'm in this kind of self business, right? Entrepreneurial. And you have these doubts, but like the stop technique, you just pretty much, you get these thoughts and you're like, yeah, uh, you just like stop. And then you stand up and you, you say something positive and you actually pat yourself on the back, like good job. And it's, <laughs> And it's so easy. This, this little thing has made more impact in my life. And it takes literally a minute a day. Wow. And, and I think it's just because you're making your conscious. You're changing your state right there. Right, right. And little things like that. And, and trust me, I, I thought this was so stupid for the longest time. You know? And so for those that are saying it's stupid, I, I get yeah. it. Yeah. 
but it's neuroscience. It's not woo woo at all. It's we associate certain things with negative feelings, right? So if you're always going down that pathway of I'm poor, I'm fat, I'm, I am i can not be in a relationship. If you're always associating negativity with these scenarios in your life, you just, you're all, you'll always see it that way. And so it's about kind of catching that thought and saying stop. And I, and it's so weird that you wouldn't even say this because I just listened to, I think her name's Sue Monk on um, the Oprah Winfrey podcast. And she was talking about that uh, kind of a very similar technique, but she counts down. Like she catch, catches herself in that state. She counts down to bring herself out of it. It's like, okay, you can feel this way for a few seconds, but not, at, the, at the end of this countdown, you're done. And it's like five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm finished. Yeah, yeah, I've seen Move it. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, right? Like, yeah. and it is, and it's changing. And it, you know, the whole law of attraction thing, I always think like, yes, that's great. But like you said, you have to put it into action and you have to like write it down. And I love that you said that, like, let's write down these goals so that we know where we're going. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there, period. Right. Writing it down, writing down the why I think is so key and coming up with that action plan of, you know, don't just sit back and think of all these la-di-da things it's okay then put them into action now that you've know where it is that you want to go how are you going to get there and start executing yeah and and the point about like the positive affirmations i think like one of the most important parts is our bodies don't know if it's real or Mm -mm. imagined right and so if you're at home and you're stressing out well you know like have you ever walked and thought that a snake was there Right, there is no snake, but your body reacts in this. Yes, yeah. You can just imagine a fight with your boss, and you'll have the same chemical response with your cortisol as you would if it was actually happening. Yes, you can be. You can be literally killing yourself with your thoughts. Yes. Right. And so you better you better be positive about them, and and it's really just a couple minutes a day. Like do once again, just pick one thing and do it, and it's. It's, it's amazing how easy it is. If a great video is that Amy Cuddy, uh, like I, I forget the title of it, it's the, the power position where uh, she's, a, she's a, like a Harvard graduate, PhD, who talks about power posing. And Amy Cuddy, you want to check it out on YouTube. Okay. It's the, I mean, like 10 million views or something. And it's actually very emotional because she tells her stories. But basically, the 10 second summary is, they had these people power pose and smile for two minutes before they went into an interview. And then they had a group that didn't do it. And the people that were evaluating them as candidates didn't know which ones were which. And they basically wanted to hire everybody who did a power pose. So two minutes can completely change your physiology just by raising your hands and being in an open position. And it's amazing. Yeah, that's it's that. absolutely amazing. So yeah, check out that video for sure. There's a book called The Buddha Brain that I read years ago that taught me all of this stuff. And he he says in there, it's a great book. If you if you're interested in what Dan and I are talking about, it's an awesome book to pick up that's kind of an introductory to it all. But I remember in the book that really stood out for me was he said, like, if you're a person that has a lot of anxiety or you're having those kind of negative thoughts, pick out like one or two times in your life where you know you were like super happy that brings you so much joy and that was just an awesome time in your life. And just take a few minutes just to go there in inside your head and it'll completely decompress your system and it's proven to show that it drops your cortisol levels just by imagining so it goes both ways right you can do it negatively we can also do it positively where you can just hold on to that moment of joy and it'll bring that joy back to you again that's awesome yeah Mm -hmm. oh yeah you guys take a couple minutes and do this find something to do it because Trust me, I'm the biggest skeptic ever. And I started doing it now. Whenever I start feeling something, I'll just do this little stop technique because it works for me. And like 15 minutes later, I'll be like, that thought's gone. It's the weirdest thing. I know, you it, but it's so cool. I'm, I feel like I'm trying to master that. I have for probably a year now where I'm mastering my emotions, like changing my state in, in a moment, right? Like, so if things are really crappy and I've had a horrible day and this just, someone just cut me off and traveled, whatever it is, my, my kind of, my mission is to try to see how quickly I can change my state. 
That's awesome. Because yeah. we're in control. And I think we forget this, right? Yeah. So Dan, I just want to leave the audience here with something that I got from your website that I just really liked. So we must provide ourselves through a mind, body, spirit approach, what we need to live our lives to the fullest. I know from experience that with this focus on health, it is very difficult to perform at an optimal level. So I think that kind of sums up everything we were talking about yeah, today, yeah. all it's the spirituality awesome. and the health. And I just want to say thank you. It was an awesome conversation. I think uh, everybody's going to get a lot from that. Surprising. Yeah, like, they're going to be surprised at just how much they're going to get from it. <laughs> <laughs> we talked on every little kind of topic there in the keto world and then some. So that was great. So thank you so much for being here, Dan. Thank you for having me.